Welcome back to another episode of Debate Night. We are back in our normal format today. We've got four great analysts to go over a few different topics. Let us know if you did enjoy the format from last week. I know we got a ton of feedback on that episode. Might be something we bring back again if uh, anybody decides to call Brody a chump again. Might have to bring him in for another 1v1. So let us know if you enjoyed that. Before we get into today's show, today's show is brought to you by Double G Craft Jerky. They have been a friend of the Foundation Network for quite some time now. They make amazing beef jerky. They also have a few other snacks such as dried fruit and trail mix one of their newest flavors um is the Ganon burr signature flavor that is the citrus teriyaki i uh, haven't tried that one yet but very excited about it they also have another a bunch of other amazing flavors such as hot boom sauce garlic lover's dream nate sex and sweet and spicy barbecue fresh cracked pepper a uh, ton of amazing flavors they offer player packs with one ounce bags that's a great option for players packs you can do subscriptions through double g jerky so you can have jerky delivered to you whatever quantity you'd like in three six or twelve months increments whatever works for you they also contribute to the double g children's foundation every bag sold contributes to that fund um, and the promotion of disc golf to the use they buy discs and baskets for inner city children and donate thousands of, of dollars to families in need of money for events so if you want to check that out make sure to click the link in the description you can use code foundation for 10 percent off and thanks again to double g jerky for sponsoring today's episode so we are back with four uh, analyst today, Brody Smith is here. New headphones could be interesting. Yeah, these are Kelsey's. My uh, my beats in that debate last week just took an absolute beating, and they are done. <laughs> so yeah. I'm in the process. As you guys know, I don't like spending money on myself, so I am currently in the process of eventually buying headphones. Mm. So okay. we shall see how long that will take. Yeah, that if if anything uh, from the past is true, that'll take about five years. Um, Tyler is joining us today as well. I uh, just want to say, let's pour one out for Aaron Rodgers. I know I was like, I was seconds from making an Aaron Rodgers jokes about Brody's or Brody's headphones there, and I was like, probably <laughs> too soon. Um, but yeah, Tyler did it for us there. Sad, sad, sad day for Jets fans. Although Rip. not as sad because they did win. Uh, Hunter is here from the warehouse today. Yeah, you know, I just want to shout out Dana for coming on last week because we have tried since the invention of debate night to get someone on to talk to Brody that was just sitting behind Twitter. And he's the first one in like, what is this, two years to actually do yeah, it. So good point. a lot of respect I, to him for coming into the Shark <laughs> The show's day. been through like three formats before we got somebody to actually debate Brody. <laughs> that, is, yeah. that is true. That is true. We'll um, see if it ever happens again, though. And then Steven is here as well today. I'm just waiting for debate night to be recorded at night so that I can be more awake for the podcast. But here no, I am. Let's do it. All right. yeah, well. <laughs> debate night is just, it, yeah, it's a false title. Um, all right. We're going to hop into today's subject. It used to be at night. That was it a did. long time ago. It did a long time ago. <laughs> it, used be, it used to be live. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to hop into our subject today. We're going to start with the Disc Mania Open, um, the <laughs> latest and greatest disc golf spectacle. Um, on the pro tour pro tour event, right? Hunter. Um, so the disc media <laughs> open recently took place in Canada, uh, serving as a silver event wedged in between worlds and a playoff event. That being MVP open, this resulted in potentially the smallest and weakest field in pro tour history. Since we all agree, this probably wasn't great scheduling on the part of the pro tour. Why do you think they did it in the first place? Is the pro tour trying to cram the schedule instead of having more off weeks? And if you do, for some reason, think this wasn't bad scheduling, feel free to insert that. I just figured it wouldn't be worth debating that one. Uh, Brody, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think anytime you sandwich an event prior to a major or post a major, the amount of people that are going to be there are going to be limited. Um, I think you you add in the fact that we are now headed into the the final playoff event, if you will, to to potentially make the tour championship. I think that also adds to the lack of field that showed up to that tournament. And then obviously now you're going into a different country. I think there are some people that legitimately don't have a way of getting into that country. So that also is a barrier of of getting people in there. But yeah, I mean I I don't really know how how they have scheduled or like why they have scheduled the stuff they have done. This is the first year. It feels like they are starting to reach out to players. They have given us a form to kind of fill out and answer some questions regarding the schedule in the future. So it looks like they are interested in trying to, um, you know, work around or figure out a better schedule. That makes sense. But um, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that some of these events occur 
because I think this just kind of shows you how small this golf still is on the tour level because we're not at a point yet where we can just like fill in a, another field of great players. It's like if the top people decide not to play an event, the field's kind of trash. <laughs> <laughs> it was def- definitely very sparse. Um, Tyler, what do you think is their mindset with this scheduling? I really don't know if I'm being really honest with you because it was like they just threw out something just to have something um, after an event. When you look at, I heard somebody say something about when you look at the PGA Tour, they always have events after majors, but it's because they have such a wide variety of great athletes that want to play in the events after worlds or a major, well, a major in this case for PGA, but to have it in another country, a silver event, it just doesn't make any sense. And when I heard Ella Hansen was doing well at this event, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea who was there. And when I popped open my UDIS app and I went to see that there's only seven FPO players playing in this event, it's a joke. And I feel bad for Ella Hansen because she, technically she got her first pro tour win, but Juliana Corver <laughs> was averaging 917 for the event. I mean, it's just embarrassing. I'm when you want to, I think a pro tour has done a great job of trending in the right direction. But for you to put out this kind of product, it's embarrassing. It's like a completely step back. I don't know why they did it. I think Brody puts up a really good point about being in another country, traveling to another country, Canada, whatever the case may be. Why not have this at the end of the season when there's just a throwaway tournament? Have people say, all right, if you want to continue playing disc golf, go play this event. If you don't want to, uh, if you want to have a break, then take a break. But after Worlds, before MVP, where we all know this is a big event, it's it's a really strange move. I have no idea. I feel like we could have planned this better than those guys, which makes no sense. Yeah, certainly a head scratcher. Uh, Hunter, what are your thoughts? Well, I think this in Rochester, just examples of not fully thought out plans. Um, I think more knowing disc golf, I think what happened is they had courses, communities that they wanted to go to. Maybe they had really good, like the Rochester event, for instance, it's been going on since like the pre PDGA era. So I think that they had like communities and courses that they wanted to get to. And if you look at the schedule, this is the only time that you're in the Northeast. You can really make it work because to, to counter Tyler's point slightly, if you put this just randomly at the end of the year, now you're asking players who live in their van to be driving from South Carolina up to Canada. And I think we would have seen an even weaker field if that's even possible. Um, but this at least like it was in the Northeast, but I think this fully supports my feelings that silver events just aren't important. Cause I think the pro tour must feel the same way to schedule these two events because they're like, Hey, who gives a rip? It's only a silver event. We don't care if seven people show up to play for this FPO title. Um, the only thing that doesn't align with that is in their communication of the win after they're still saying pro tour win. I mean, even though this was, I, I think there was C tiers that were stronger than this field. Um, so it's a pretty tough scene, but I think it is just, they wanted to go to these courses. They wanted to go to these communities and this was the only time it fit in. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they had a silver event team and an actual pro tour team. And it also, I think, bodes to eventually silver events will be qualifying events. And then this won't even be a storyline because if a corn Ferry tour event happens the same weekend as a PGA tour event, no one bats an eye. Yeah, certainly. Um, hard to see where their mind is at. Steven, what did you think about the scheduling? <laughs> going to, going last on this one is a little tough here. Um, a lot of good points by everybody. I think that the Pro Tour ultimately, uh, to Hunter's point, wanted to experiment with this course. Prince Edward Island has been kind of talked about for years now as a potential stop uh, for the uh, for the Disc Golf Pro Tour. And so with that location, I think that it was – uh, a good idea to go there now whether or not at this point in time was a good idea obviously that's not the case um, but regarding the schedule as a whole it's entirely too crammed just all throughout the season not even at the end but throughout the entire season you're seeing almost you're seeing coverage on the on the dgn almost every single weekend whether it's a silver event an elite or a major. So I think that they need to rethink that concept, um, especially with how small the tour is on a grand scale. Uh, ultimately, I think Hunter's right. They need to disconnect the Silver Series from Pro Tour points. Um, it needs to be 
uh, up and comers. And if mm -hmm. a pro wants to go and play in the event, I think they should be able to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that will open up the schedule more, ultimately not assigning points to those Silver Series events. It'll give pros uh, more time to recover and play their best disc golf at the events that matter. Yeah, I think there's a there's just an, a weird balance going on where you have a lot of the pros who are already out there on the road, don't really have means of getting back home. They want to play disc golf, but then you have events like this where it just doesn't attract a crowd. I, I see your point there, Stephen, with the the course experimenting. That's a that's a good point where you know that is one thing the silvers can serve to do. But this one certainly felt like a flop. I mean, seven seven players in FPO that is pretty shocking. Um, I think Tog said it best. It's just a little embarrassing for that event to have have gone on really. Um, all right. So we're going to move on, uh, from that event. There's not really a ton to talk about with that silver event. We're going to kind of rehash some stuff from, um, from the, the kind of after effects of world since we had a little bit of an off week last week. Um, so Isaac Robinson winning worlds has immediately tightened up the player of the year race. We obviously had a pretty heated debate a couple weeks ago about the player of the year scenarios. I think there is, I think this just makes it infinitely more complicated. And the central part of this question is how many pro tour wins is a major worth because now Isaac Robinson's resume boasts those two major wins. He's going up a couple against a couple guys that have um, more wins, but they're not majors. So my question is simply, is Isaac Robinson the player of the year right now? And regardless of what you think about that, how many pro tour wins do you think a major is worth? How does that ratio work out in your mind, Tyler? So I actually think we need to look at each individual major. I think Worlds is worth about four wins. My guess for USDGC would be about three. And then the other two would be about two wins. Would wow. Be the thing I would put it into. But what's crazy is that when you look at if you're if we're talking about two people winning the player of the year it's got to be between calvin and isaac and calvin has isaac elite series and majors he's got calvin has isaac 11 to 5 on record but calvin's got two wins in the elite series isaac has two wins you know in majors so and the other thing is that calvin is on nearly 94 percent in top tens which is really impressive across the entire season Isaac is about nine, uh, 56% in the top 10. Isaac isn't as consistent, but when it comes down to it, it comes down to wins. And Isaac has to be your guy who's going to win it. He's won two majors. We haven't seen that in a long time. Um, it's If you were saying, hey, we're playing in a major, who are you gonna, who, who's your guy, Isaac or Calvin? I know we just did the poll the other day on Twitter. I think people need to really look at themselves in the mirror. I think we'd rather <laughs> choose Isaac rather than Calvin when it comes down to majors. I just think we're all pulling for Calvin. Now, if Calvin wins at USDGC, we might be able to have this discussion again, which would be a lot of fun to have. But you got to give it to Isaac right now. Okay. High value there, Hunter. You seem to disagree with that that yeah, ratio. I, I mean, Worlds being four Pro Tour wins is a, is a pretty shocking take. I would agree in the scheme of money it makes you as a player, it's probably worth four because then your name gets put on discs and yada, yada, yada. We value the Worlds win so heavily. But when it comes to actual like tournament and how we should factor for player of the year, four is pretty crazy. Um, in my opinion, Calvin's not in the conversation anymore. Calvin's deuces. Uh, the dude's got to win. He hasn't won since like April. So he's gone. I don't care what your body of work is. If you don't win, you're not in the conversation. I also don't think Isaac Robinson is the player of the year. Currently, I think a major equals close to two pro tour wins, probably like 1.75, but somewhere close to two. So let's give Isaac four. Gannon has three pro tour wins. And then he has two silver wins. Silvers, you got to look at case by case. So I'm giving him 0.3 for the Kansas City wide open because that was, I mean, there's really no one there. I'm giving him 0.5 for the other one because it was one of the stronger silver events. So that puts Gannon at 3.8. Isaac, either at four or at 3.5. Either way, I think you got to go head to head in that situation because we're close enough for context to matter. Shout out to Dust back there. Um, close enough for context to matter here. And when you go head to head, then you have Gannon 12 to eight on the season against Isaac with a higher top 10 percentage as well. So if the season into right now, Gannon Burr is my player of the year. <laughs> I love, I love the math. Um, <laughs> I like, <laughs> I like assigning the signing the point ratio. All right, so give that surprises me a little bit. Gannon is your player of the year currently, Steve. Me too, but math doesn't lie. Okay, <laughs> Steven, weigh in on the numbers. What do you think? So I'm going off the numbers. I'm going completely on the other side of Hunter here. I still think Calvin's player of the year. Oh, we all got pissed when Paige did not win player of the year and the recency bias took over and the recency bias is taking over here. I think that Calvin's body of work this year, this entire season <laughs> 
has been way too good for us to ignore, even if he's not winning since April. I completely understand Hunter's point. I just am not a fan of personally trying to say a major win is worth this many or this many or this many elite wins, when in reality, a major is worth the same amount of tour points as an elite plus event. So what are we really talking about when it comes to assigning a major worth more or less wins on the tour? Player of the year standings for me right now, I think Calvin won, Isaac two, Gannon three. Wow. Okay. A very big variety of takes. I did not expect this. Brody, bring in the hammer. What do you got? <laughs> Man, to, I'm just looking at Calvin's season and like, it, it is true that winning matters so much because you quickly forget like the last, you have to go back to Portland to find yep. Calvin outside the top five. Mm -hmm. And then to find Calvin outside the top 10, you have to go back to Champions Cup where he got six, 16th. And that was the only time he was outside the top 10 this year. Looking looking at Isaac, Isaac, the recency bias is going to be there. You know, he, he, has, he has the two majors. Um, but like looking at his season overall, he's got an 82nd, a 52nd, a 45th, um, a 20th a 30th, a 31st, a 15th. So like, it's, it's one of those where it's like, it's a weird one for sure, because, you know, to me, it kind of makes sense to have the player of the year, like for it to maybe not though. Cause then we wouldn't be having the discussion, right? Like if they mm, did just do, Hey, player of the year, it's just going to be whoever has the most tour points at the end of the season. That's player of the year. Um, we wouldn't be having a discussion and it would just be going to Calvin most likely, right? Unless Calvin doesn't show up at MVP and Isaac does, it's going to be Calvin. Um, but I think those are the only three that actually have a case, Calvin, Isaac, and Gannon. And I will first say it is absolutely wild to hear that firsthand from Tyler, but I think that is sometimes how delusional some disc golf people are when they're just like, oh yeah, world's... <laughs> Worlds counts as four <laughs> tournaments. It's like if you, I, I, and I get Hunter's Hunter makes a good point of like, yes, it probably does. It's I, I would actually argue that it's way more than four, right? Like if, if Isaac ended up winning four disc golf pro tour events, his uh, contract, whichever next one he signs would be significantly less than four times. I, I mean, I would, I would argue it could be like a 10 X, of what his contract is going to be for being a world championship. So on the financial side, I get it, but uh, as a player side, like playing worlds is just like playing USCGC. It's just like playing champions cup. The field isn't any different. Obviously there might be a little more pressure because we know all that money is, is on the back end. But as far as like winning it is concerned, the field isn't this incredible thing of where it's like, Holy cow. All that being said, I think Calvin, this is, this is my big brain. I think Calvin's <laughs> going to win USCGC. So I'm taking him player of the year. Mm, okay. So you're, we, you're hedging. We, that wasn't the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I don't we, care, if, Hunter, if you told someone who hadn't watched disc golf all year, that somebody won two majors this year and didn't won worlds, you'd have to say, what the heck did that other guy do? to beat someone who won two majors this year. Yeah, uh, that's that's where we're going to get into this next question because I, uh, well, maybe, I don't even know if I'm actually going to be able to talk about this next one, but that's where I think the debate for player of the year is the same thing as like this GOAT debate. Everyone has a different opinion on what they think player of the year is. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're going to look at who had the best season, some people are going to say, if you didn't win, I do not care. So like to me, like, if someone got skill. second, if someone got second place at every event and someone else missed the cut and then won two majors, I think you're going to have people arguing both sides. And it, I think that's what makes it very, very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's what makes it good. You know, it, this is what makes this fun. And this is one of the hardest years. I think this will end up being potentially one of the most difficult years to decide player of the year because of how things are shaping up. I mean, right now, it's there's three guys that have a case. I'm sure if the season, the season could end in a way where it cements some guy. I mean, if Isaac wins another major, this is not really a well, conversation. If Calvin wins a, a major down the stretch here, at used see not really a conversation. Probably sleep on Eagle. Eagle's coming off a win. 
So if that is Eagle true. Just momentum. Win, <laughs> big momentum Eagle, play there. And, that, and that's Eagle the other thing we're out. forgetting is, is there if could Eagle be, wins out. what if Ricky Wysocki takes the not last two tournaments of the year? Or Simon. Like, there are so many guys in the conversation this year. It's also a game of definitions, though, right? Because it's like, how do you define player of the year, like Brody said? But then, do you define it as the player with the most wins or the guy that played the best? And But do you define the person playing the best as somebody who just threw the least amount of strokes or the guy who actually won? is winning playing the best, you know, so good, I, good luck this year. I, I would, I would have to say that winning is what matters the most because that's what sports are about, but right. you don't you show know. up to a tournament to come in the top <laughs> yeah. five all season long and get patted on the back with a little participation trophy on your way home. You show up to win. That's right. Calvin hasn't yeah. done it since April. You play that's to right. win the Not game. Right. <laughs> Calvin has won less than Gannon <laughs> and he's never won a major. Isaac has two of them this year. There's Calvin Heimberg, win, Calvin Heimberg is going to die without a major. Calvin Heimberg will never win a major. No he can't way. win. Dang. Wow. Hunter's doubling wow. and tripling down. So, uh, with that being said, no one is talking about Gannon. With that being said, Calvin probably win USTGC and take it all. No, dude, don't you dare, bro. <laughs> don't you dare. You're dying on that. that no, I like. I I do like Isaac at USDGC. I think the course plays well for him, and gotta, I I would love, love to see the Calvin stands if Isaac wins three out of the four majors. You just proved my point well, that I, I said mean, a minute ago. Can we can we stop saying like <laughs> courses play well for players? Like the disc golf yeah, courses aren't. Thank you, Brody. Disc golf courses aren't that much different from one another. They really Fully aren't. Fully no. disagree. They, it, you we, can watch it happen. You get like you knew Chris Dickerson I, and Isaac Robbins were gonna play good at GMC because the course plays good for them and the course plays bad I, for other players. And what happens? I, they I played would, well. I would. This is what I would say for like someone like Isaac. Isaac's not going to unless unless you go to a course where you're requiring 900 foot par fours, which is very rare that we ever see courses like that. Isaac is so good at disc golf. It doesn't matter what course he plays at. It's just whether or not he's going to play good that week. He can throw you straight at, and he can throw the hyzer. You look at Calvin Heimberg. The only difference between Calvin Heimberg and Isaac really is consistency. Calvin you, like doesn't really would have you not an agree that Isaac can separate himself more on certain courses though. I will, I will, I will agree that there are some players that you can eliminate with certain courses. But when we're talking about these top players and we're like, oh, this course sets up the, the, the every course sets up well for Isaac. He's that good. He's, yeah. he's freaking good at disc golf. So like. Yes. So, so I would I agree. I would I mean, say he's more like disc golf, I agree with that, but I don't think he's going to win on that West coast swing. When you're going to golf courses, it brings too many other players he, into the he, equation. Did he almost win Portland? Yeah, he took, he took second or third, right? Almost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. He didn't win. He didn't win. I love it. Hey, you play to win the game. That's what Hunter always says. Um, uh, all right. We're going to move on and talk a little bit more about Isaac fourth here. at Portland. So, and third at OTB. Yeah. So, okay. He's bad. Uh, let's, he's bad. let's go. Let's go to a different. Let's go to a different topic. <laughs> he we he has no to, chance we'll, on we the West bring, Coast. We're gonna bring that topic in next week because that's an interesting one to go over. Um. All right. So so Isaac, um, I'm not sure on his exact contract status. Somebody might have this. We all know that contracts in disc golf don't really matter, anyways. Um. I think that's starting to change a little bit, but you know how it is. Um. So my question is, you know, everybody's been talking about Eagle and Gannon as the two big free agents, the two extremely valuable free agents that are going to bring in the next massive deals. Isaac Robinson, also very young. I think he's younger than me. I want to say he's only 22, 23 at the oldest. Um, he's starting to make a, a very big case for himself as potentially the most valuable prodigy player. I mean, Gannon's there and he's, he's winning these majors, proving to be pretty marketable, likable guy. So my question is if Isaac were to hit the market this off season, let's just say what he did, would he be a more valuable free agent than Eagle and Gannon Hunter? No. Uh, my reasoning for this is mainly because I think the three players in this question, Isaac Robinson, Eagle and Gannon all have very similar ceilings, which is, as good of a player as we've ever seen on the face of the earth. I think Eagle and Gannon have a little bit better distance potential, um, mainly by their build. And with that, I think they're a little bit more future-proof players. But what it really comes down to is marketability. And I think Gannon and Eagle both have more personalities that shine through. Isaac's a very reserved guy. I think a lot of people will resonate with him. He will be able to move plastic, but I don't think he's going to be able to move plastic at the rate that Eagle and Gannon will. And I think all three of them are set up to have very successful careers in the future probably multiple majors coming to all of them in the future. And when you're looking at that, they all have really high ceilings. They'll have really high potential. They're probably all going to meet those ceilings and you got to go with the most marketable. I think Eagles, the most valuable Gannon two. And then if Isaac were to be a free agent, Isaac three. Mm, okay. Interesting. All right, Steven, do you agree? Man, he took my entire spiel 
out from under me on that one. Um, good point. I have your Hunter. notes in front of me. <laughs> I, apparently, so you, are you sharing my screen? I don't know. But, um, you know, ultimately, I agree with Hunter. No, uh, Isaac is not more valuable. Eagle and Gannon are both obviously more valuable by a considerable amount. Like, I don't even think Ooh. it's close. Oh, uh, You know, it doesn't come from the accolades in the disc golf arena. Yes, obviously we saw with James Conrad what that did for him, but it still didn't necessarily change his contract status. He was already with MVP. He just made a buttload of money off of Envy's. And so Eagle... Uh, I think ultimately he has a very successful vlog. Gannon is, yes, definitely one of the most likable personalities on tour. And what Gannon does is he works his way into content no matter where it is. I see Gannon on a ton of different channels all over YouTube, and that sells plastic. And in the end, you know, selling plastic is king when you're talking about manufacturer contracts. Very true. Very true. Gannon, he, that guy is everywhere constantly. Uh, all right, Brody, do you agree with these guys or what do you think? Yeah, it's an interesting one for sure. Um, because the, the James Conrad ones, you know, the winning worlds obviously does, does have a massive impact, but I think for some players, it has a lot more staying power than others. And we have seen that in the past. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with how, who and how they want to market Isaac. Uh, I think that would be my argument is depending on where Isaac ends up going or staying. Cause it did sound like he was very happy with prodigy when we talked to him on the podcast and it didn't sound like he would be interested in leaving unless obviously again, money talks, right? So if someone's offering him two times with prodigy is he's probably gone. So it'd be interesting to see kind of how they market and push, you know, what, what this is, are they going to come out with his name on it? All these things I think are major factors. Um, I would say out of those three Eagle probably is the most, the more popular player of those three, uh, especially internationally as well, since Eagle has been coming over to uh, Europe for years now and has played in more international events. Like when you go over to the European open Eagles, one of the bigger uh, names from uh, the United States going over there. Uh, so yeah, I'd probably say, I'd probably say Eagle Gannon and Isaac. I don't know, man, two majors and how much, how much whoever wants to push Isaac will push him. He's a very marketable guy. If you know, he's not going to necessarily maybe go out there and like create the content himself. But I think if you had someone doing that, I think, I think he is a very marketable player. So okay. It's just kind of how how much they want to invest into someone like that. All right. So, Tyler, everybody loving Eagle so far. Do you agree? Yeah. I thought about seeing me and the last guy that everybody was going to say Eagle. So, I was about to make a case for somebody else. But I do have something I do want to say after uh, my spiel with Eagle. Yeah, I'm going to double down and use this comparison. It, yeah, it's Eagle. It's Eagle. Okay. In ball golf, we have John Daly, and I'm going to say Zach Johnson. If I told, if I ask a random person, do you know who John Daly is? <laughs> Most people would say yes, and if they know a little bit about golf, because John Daly is this guy who hits the long ball. He did win some majors, so he does have some accolades. But everyone loves the long ball. Everyone loves the showboat. Everyone loves the guy who is powerful. That is Eagle. Eagle is just more marketable across the board. And we've seen that. We've seen it from Simon. Simon really hasn't been winning until the last couple of years. And Simon sold a ton of plastic. He is the king of moving plastic. Now that he's winning, it's just an extra, right? But I want to say something about Gannon and Isaac, which is really fascinating. As Stephen was starting to allude to, Gannon is now uploading more content on YouTube as of today because he's feeling the pressure of Isaac winning worlds. Isaac is, you're not seeing Isaac and Gannon together. I think what Prodigy needs to do is they need to <laughs> push these guys against each other. Right? Oh, yeah. Isaac has been going on podcasts <laughs> and saying, I'm the man. And Gannon he was sitting in the background. His face was never happy on the Nick and Matt show at all. <laughs> Gannon hates this. So now what you need to do is you need to push Gannon versus Isaac the whole rest of the season and into next season. That is how you're going to make Prodigy marketable. And that's how you make them both marketable. But besides that, you know. Eagle is your guy. But you have to push a narrative. This Isaac versus Gannon. I can't wait to see how the season 
pans out, I hope there's like this stone cold face when Ganon and Isaac are playing against each other. Can you imagine I... you, the the uh, pro tour, those two guys on the final card battling it out towards the end? It would be electric. It would be it would be a marketing dream come true for everybody involved if those guys decided to hate each other. <laughs> because, and I don't I don't want that to happen. But push. I sounds the like rivalry. No, push I think the rivalry. Let's push, push, push that rivalry. rivalry. <laughs> if if uh, if you had those guys like seriously squaring up, you'd have the pro tour would love that. Prodigy would love. That. I mean, it would just be. I like it though. I like we're looking we're looking for rivalries wherever we can get it in this sport. Sometimes we got to read into it, it a little bit. We love the Ricky and Paul. We got to get the new rivalry. Also, game. shout out Zach Johnson, Masters champion. Yeah. <laughs> Google him. Yeah. One of the um, worst tee shots I've ever seen. Amazing. Well, you remember, he hit it off the tee marker. Hole twelve mm-hmm. or thirteen. Hole thirteen. Yeah. Um, all right, we're gonna get into our last topic here. Um, I figured we had to touch on this. It's been long enough. I don't really think we've talked about it enough on debate night. Um, so since our podcast network is mostly centered around trophies, now we're kind of the trophy podcast network. Uh, I want to hear everybody's best and worst trophy of the season and your reasoning. So whatever trophy you thought really was the best one and the worst one and, and why um, I think this will be interesting. Steven, what do you have? Uh, first off, the amount of hate that Brody gets for talking about trophies is laughable. Um, I think that it should be talked about. Ultimately, trophies bring prestige to sports. And, you know, you talk about the Lombardi, Lord Stanley's Cup. You know, these are instantly recognizable in every single person. You know, even if you don't follow sports, if you look at the Stanley Cup, you know exactly what it is. And, you know, ultimately, Disc Golf Pro Tour, it's in its infancy. It is an individual sport, which makes things difficult because every single tournament has to come up with a trophy. And, uh, you know, the PDGA, DGPT, they haven't really defined anything about what a trophy really should be in the world of disc golf. Um, My favorite trophy, uh, and I might get some flack for this, is the Music City Open Gibson Guitar. Um, Mm. I think that it's unconventional, but it fits the theme. It leaves a lasting mark in your brain. The worst might have to be this last weekend. Good God. Eagles trophy <laughs> looked like the vase that I made my mom at one of those like Home Depot kids days. <laughs> yeah. It was absolutely brutal. Um, but again, like I said, maybe not everybody's taste, but I do like the guitar. Okay. Okay. Going with the guitar, Brody. Let's hear it. Trophy expert. Well, here's the thing is like, <laughs> was, was, was no one talking about trophies? Is that why like people get, why are people, I don't get, I don't get the people that I get really upset. And I will say a good point in the sense of like trying to like stab me is like, Oh, go out and win one. And it's like, okay, I will accept that that's a good comeback. However, for you to think that I've never won a, a trophy before, if there are people that are playing disc golf and you've never won a trophy before, I feel bad for you. I don't know what sports you played growing up, but that's tough that you have never have won a trophy. We've all won trophies, I feel like. So I feel like we all know when there was a cool trophy and when there wasn't a cool trophy. And I actually just talked to Simon because uh, we did a practice round with him. And I was curious about his take because he's someone that has won a lot of trophies in the last two years. And I think he summed it up perfectly. I think he said a trophy can either add so like you win the tournament and then you get a dope trophy and it adds to the moment of where it's like, holy cow, like sick or like literally does nothing. Right. So you just get a trophy and you're just like, okay, I, there's not really like a negative thing of about a bad trophy for the winners. However, there is a massive negative when you're taking photos with winners and you're posting around social media and people are looking at that and being like, yikes. And so I don't know this idea. Like where was no one ever critical of trophies to me? I feel like people have always been critical of them, but no one's willing to come out and say it. I don't know. I don't think I'm the first one that's like, Oh, let me, uh, let me criticize these trophies. Cause they look bad this year. I'm pretty sure disc golf has had, I've seen photos from in the past. Disc golf's had bad trophies for a long time. So I don't get, I don't get why people don't like critiquing There's money them. in the sport now. So now their expectations have risen. Sure. But it's still like, you still like, uh, you guys talked about Paul shooting up a bunch of his old trophies. Like there's still, <laughs> there's still people that get a trophy. And it's like, yeah, I'm just going to put this in my backyard and shoot a shotgun through it. Like that's yeah. what comes <laughs> in their mind. So it's not like there's a new thing of like, Oh, now we can. Uh, okay. With that being said, 
Um, I, I think obviously the the pencil holder trophy from this past week, uh, the air fil- <laughs> the air filter, <laughs> the uh, air filter. Holder. pencil holder, what, good one. Whatever whatever you want to call it, like that that was really, really bad. The photo that Eagle or the you know the the still image of Eagle receiving it and being like, what is this? Um, that that's pretty good. Uh, the the other one that like jumps out at me because there, there's been a lot, but the other one that jumps out at me of like not being great was the Kansas City wide open one, where it was like a it was like a um like a, a me, uh what do they call that when you when you like smack a ha- metal with a hammer forging was it yeah. anvil. No, you remember it was like a metal, it was like a piece of metal, and it was like it looked like it was unfinished. Yes. And, uh, oh yes, yes. It had yeah. the spade or whatever. Yeah. Yep. AW which was like not even it just lined looked up. Unfinished, it's, yeah. Yeah, that that one and again, here's the thing, guys. I'm not I'm not hating on your history. If there's crazy history with the trophies and all that stuff, that's fine. I'm sure there's some people that think the green jacket is stupid in golf, right? Like people are gonna have their opinions about everything. Um, my best trophy, it was interesting that you said Gibson electric guitar. Cause like, to me, I think that's a cop out because like, if someone just gave away like a private jet, like, I don't think that's actually a good trophy, but obviously well, you can display a guitar. Sure. But like, if you walked into someone's house and they had a guitar on the thing, I'm going to be like, why, what's that guitar? What significance does that guitar have? And there's going to be like, I, it's a trophy. Well, it's a good time. It would be, 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 be better if someone was like, Yeah, I, I got this. Jimi Hendrix sent me this guitar that he used to play. Like, do you, you know what I'm saying though? That's what I'm thinking. What's like, your favorite hang- trophy? Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> give me the Viking axe. Ooh, okay. really? He likes the axe. You go, a guitar is not a trophy, and then you take an axe. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. That is that's an interesting one, too, there. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> like your whole argument was like, it's what's just the, what's an, the story it's if just... I walk in and I'm like, what's the significance of that battle axe on the wall? Yeah. It's way right. cooler if like that dude from well, Game d- of Thrones d- sent it, it to me versus it I, have, it I think it does say doesn't it literally have, P- doesn't literally say PCS open like on I think isn't it does. Like it, I will say a, that is a big difference. I don't think the guitar said anything on it. And no, like, the guitar is a guitar. The other one is right. actually like it's actually created like a trophy. Like it actually has stuff on it to make it look like it's not it just does help a lot. It's not now. Now it's not the the hammer. I I someone sent me that with an LP. It was an LPGA college golf, and it literally looked like someone just had bought a hammer from the Home Depot and then just like put text the on it. Like, say music City it, it, it it does say MPO champion on it. So does that change your opinion? Mm. It says I'll have music to look City at it. I could I could change MPO it. Let me champion. let me look. Let me look. It's been Double a while. Check. All right. Well, Tyler, while he's researching that, let's hear yours. So I just want to say the fact that we're talking more about trophies than we are about the winners is pretty embarrassing for the PDGA, the Disc Golf Pro Tour. I mean, this many open, man. It's all ridiculous. <laughs> By the way, the fact that we're thinking about the trophy was a fancy thing that you bought from Staples for two ninety nine is ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that pencil holder. It's exactly what, what that was. But yeah, I mean, uh, I'm it's gonna... local art. Yeah. Well, please have please have respect. Yeah, I know. I get that. Whatever, dude. You know. So I, I'm just gonna cut right to the chase. My best and my favorite trophy, honestly, is the one that they just presented at Worlds. I think it was super cool piece of glass, colored in it. I thought it was cool. I wish it was engraved, uh, as Brody had said. The thing that's so disappointing is that in in all individual sports at majors, they have a trophy that's been in history forever, where you have every engraved person on it who's won. Why do we not have that for Worlds? It is ridiculous, and it's an embarrassment that we do not have that in our sport. Get on it, engrave all the people that have won it, and let's have it. What'd you say? Because we're different. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I don't care if we're different or whatever, dude. Like, it's just if you want people to enjoy history of disc golf, you have to have it. Anyways, all right. Worst tro- my ba- favorite trophy was the one at Worlds. I think it was super cool looking. My worst is the cowboy hat. The cowboy, oh. hat, the cowboy hat looks like it's just a regular hat and someone slapped a hello my name is sticker on it and put, <laughs> and put the winner on it like i feel bad for gannon gannon put on the hat and made it a joke and like was gonna wear it in rounds and whatnot like that's a cool memory but like these items are not trophies they're items brody hit it if someone walked in your house and they saw that it'd be like cool hat cool axe cool guitar 
but no one's going to say cool trophy. They're not trophies. I get we're disc golf. I get we're different. That's what we do. That's fine. And I'm okay with it, but they're not quote unquote trophies. Let's make some cool trophies, please. Let's make some cool trophies. I, (laughs) sorry, Hunter, take it away. Uh, so this can't be the answer because you said best trophy of the season, but the best trophy in disc golf by far hasn't happened yet, which is the USDGC because they give out the like little glass jar or whatever. And sometimes that's what's taking a picture. But the real trophy is that huge thing. It's at the big glass on top has the USDGC logo and every name is on that with a little gold plate. And it's been here for so long. Uh, best trophy in disc golf, but that's not, hasn't happened this season yet. So that won't be my answer. Um, in my opinion, I think the Waco trophy this year has accomplished the best of what disc golf's trying to do while still being a trophy. Is it perfect? No. Uh, First off for my worst trophy, I'm also not going to include silver events. So I'm also not including silver events from best trophy because they're not pro tour events. And I was asked about the pro tour season. So Waco is the best trophy so far. It has like context of being Waco, you know, I, I think it's the bridge there or something, but it's a wooden thing. But the key is it's got the base where if you walk into someone's house and it's sitting there, it's got the base, it's got a little pop-up with the logo, very clearly a trophy Hmm. while still having that unique flair context. Uh, I'm not going to go with the Music City as the worst. I'm not going to go with the Open at Austin as the worst because they're at least clear context. Music City, guitar, Open at Austin, hat. What I think is the worst is one that there's not clear context, which is the Idlewild propeller. Because if you've been to Idlewild, you understand there's an airport close by. But if I'm just at home watching and you hand the dude a propeller... Like, I'm pretty sure the lake house we vacationed to as kids had that same propeller on the wall. I don't understand where. This is what I want to pitch to disc golf. Okay, first off, first pitch is maybe we just forget trophies for a while, hand out big checks, let everything calm down, because at least big checks, you're not going to make a fool out of yourself. But if we want to go trophies, this is the litmus test. If you can take what you've bought as a trophy and walk into Cracker Barrel and hang it up on the wall, and people will come in and out and not realize that it's there, you don't have a trophy. (laughs) <laughs> so I think that's a good litmus test. You know, if people are going to walk in and be like, oh, what did they win an award for? Boom, you have a trophy. But if you're just hanging that propeller or the guitar or for the Silver Series, what did someone hand out a paddle, right, to like a kayak or something? I mean, maybe we are going to crack a barrel and shopping for them. Maybe that's the problem to begin with. But mm. I think best Waco, worst is Idlewild. Good point. We, feel, we feel like Allen Iverson. Like, what are we talking about right now? We're talking about trophies. <laughs> trophies. <laughs> not what are we game. talking about? Wait. Not, not, not can the I keep t- Trophies. Can I keep talking or am I, am I dead? What do you want to say? Uh, what has everyone, have, has everyone yes. talked about trophies? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, d- I did a little more research. I will say the fact that it does have text on the guitar that that does change it for me. That makes the guitar better. Um, but I'm I'm looking at this axe, guys. I'm telling you right now, no one in their right mind would ever use this thing in battle. They would get absolutely <laughs> annihilated. It just makes absolutely no sense. This is it. This is a decorative axe. It's a decorative and axe. For, and for that, I think I'm we okay go with decorative it. Decorative items or trophies now. Mm. That's the route we go. What were we talking about? Like a, there was a decorative propeller for Idlewild. What what is a cup? It wasn't a real propeller. I'm not flying with that. What is a cup, you thing. genius? What is a cup, you genius? I don't like mm. cups. I didn't choose what cups. What is a cup, you genius? I didn't choose cups. I don't like the cup trophies. We're not oh, golf. Oh, the Stanley Cup is this. a bad trophy. Stanley Cup's a bad trophy. No, it's completely different. I thought we were talking disc golf cups. It's a cups. cup. It's I thought we were talking cup. disc golf cups. That's my bad. <laughs> it's I a, it's disc a disc decorative cups. cup. It's a decorative <laughs> cup. <laughs> oh, the Stanley they literally put liquid in the Stanley Cup and drink out of it. I the case. Don't don't advance me, but you just got you just got bodied on that right there. Um, the decorative cup. Yeah, yeah. The Stanley, the Stanley Cup's not cup. a decorative cup. I mean, let's be real. You're not walking into someone's house opening their cabinet and the Stanley Cup's sitting there. Because no, it's because, it's a de- because it's a decorative <laughs> cup. You don't put a cup and pour a drink into it and drink it, from it. it. It's closer to a vase than a cup. Decorative it doesn't matter. Vase. It's a decorative <laughs> vase. It's a decorative vase. <laughs> the word decorative. It's custom made. Forward. I think custom made is the important thing. Like it was, yeah. it, it was uniquely yes. made for that event. And it has yeah. a base with the names on it. Another thing That's that helps where... it be a trophy. If you mount that guitar on a sick base and you hand it to someone, it's got the base that says like Music City Open Trophy and you're holding it and the guitar's on top. Completely different. Now we're a trophy. Well, we're not a guitar. Well, what I would say with the guitar one. Now we're a bass would, guitar. What I would say. Ooh. What I would say with the guitar one is like the guitar one seems like it would, there should be like a trophy, 
and then the guitar is like the thing you get for winning it right and like yeah. that's just every, they, they're known for you get a guitar for yeah. winning this tournament mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't make sense to like be the trophy if that makes yeah. sense. what trophy i will talk, say right? uh runner up in my opinion i don't know if this is going to spiral us into something else but I also don't like the cookie cutter trophy. I think runner up for worst trophies Jonesboro, because I'm pretty sure that was the same trophy that was handed out for our conference championship in basketball in high school. It's just like you walk into any trophy shop, and you're like, I'll take that one, sir. And that was a Jonesboro trophy. I don't like that either. I think we should try a little harder um, mm. than just ordering a random trophy out of a catalog. Hunter's got a high at your I, high school basketball team. I goodness. would say that if, if all the tournaments order trophies from the catalog that were expensive enough, at least that we would have a lot better trophies than we do right now. What but, if we just did like a point. dark horse theme? What if we just all decide like, we're going to give out flags. And so whenever you win a tournament, you get a flag the people hold it behind them. They that's run it like they're in the Olympics. And like, that's just disc golf's trophy is that's a just flag. Cool. You just, how many flags can you collect? You got a flag wall at home. All yeah. Right. Kind of like ribbons and ribbons and swimming. Okay. All right. We're, Let's hear in the flag. Below. We're a flag sport. Smash that like button. If you want to hand out flags instead of trophies, <laughs> good, uh, good pull on the Waco trophy though, Hunter. That is a very good trophy. Very good Thank trophy. Um, well done. They need a, whoever made their trophy should make the rest of them. Cause it was very, was custom. It, is that just a decorative bridge? It's just a decorative bridge. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right, we're okay. gonna move into our rapid fire round now. Brody, Steven, goodbye. All right, Tyler and Hunter, here we go. This is kind of a new, fresh matchup here. This is this is good. This is fun. Um, hopefully, this one won't end in. Well, actually, I kind of hope it does end in you guys yelling at each other. Uh, all right, <laughs> we're gonna. Tyler, you have the lead. Would you like to go first or second? Uh, give me first. All right, this one's a little bit spicy here. So, Paul Ulibarri recently defended Paige Pierce as the GOAT um, on the Tour Life podcast, claiming that she demonstrated similar levels of dominance for longer than Kristen. He he was constantly saying, you know, we've seen this before. That was kind of what he said. You know, we, we've seen this before. So do you agree? Are we too quick to call Kristen the GOAT if you're even calling her the GOAT? Um, I won't put words in your mouth, Tyler. Yes, I think we are. Um, if you're looking at it, like this is the old... Like we've talked about this all in the last week, Ken Climo versus Paul McBeth. You can also refer to ball golf and talk about Jack Nicholas versus Tiger Woods. Kristen has been very dominant and she just got rated 999 as of today. And I think that's something to talk about and, and mention. And she's been very dominant the last couple of years. She's been great. She's got the full game. But if you're talking about the greatest of all time, you really have to say who's been doing it for the longest period of time, the most dominant period of time her longevity you got to say it's paid she's been cracking fools for a long time and just because she hasn't been playing that well lately doesn't mean that we can't acknowledge that she done she's done very special things the thing that separated her from the field back in the day was circle two putting nowadays we do have better athletes according to rating and according to more players finishing uh, closer to what she scored the problem is, is that we just uh, we've seen too many good players and they're battling with her. And so I think right now you can't give it to Kristen. We got to see, I think, at least two more years of what Kristen can do. Uh, we can't knock out all the majors that Paige has won. I think she's won 18 majors. So you can't disregard what she's done in the accolades. But this is one that we could be battling down and I could go either side, but I'm choosing Paige for this one. OK, yeah, certainly a lot there um, in the history. Hunter, do you agree? Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, I do agree, because I think yeah. that the Kristen case is a, a classic recency bias because we are watching one of the most dominant seasons of all time. I'm not going to say Kristen can't get there to be the GOAT. I think she's the most talented player to ever play the sport of disc golf on the FPO field. But we act as though Paige Pierce has been irrelevant for a long time. She won two majors last year. I just looked at it. She hasn't been irrelevant for that long. And what we have to remember is if we remove ourselves and our current knowledge and we fast forward 20 years, People are going to look back at the careers of Kristen and Paige, and they're not going to look at what Kristen did this year and think that it was so much better than what Paige was doing a few years ago, even though it is. They're going to be looking at accolades. And when you go accolades to accolades, Paige wins. But what Kristen will have at the end of this year, if my predictions are right, first off, we already know highest rated player FPO of all time. Will ratings still matter in the future? Who knows? If they do, she has that secondary thing that I think she will have that Paige has never done is the season Grand Slam. They both have career Grand Slams. But if Kristen wins U.S. Women's, Paige Pierce hasn't done that in one season. That would do it this season. That's another big thing that can be used to argue for Kristen. 
if Kristen has like two more years of dominance, then the era talk starts happening and stuff like that. Now Kristen's the GOAT. I think that's kind of more when I'm talking about Kristen Tatar as the GOAT. I'm almost assuming those things are going to happen. But who's to say Paige Pierce doesn't recover from this leg injury, come back and have a dominant year next year, and then shuts all of it up and Paige slams the door and says, I'm the GOAT, get walking. So it's too early to call Kristen the GOAT. All signs point to she probably will be. But if you remove yourself from the argument, it's Paige clearly clear as day right now. Just imagine if Paige won Worlds next year over Kristen. We, that would break disc golf, I think. Yeah, and it could easily happen. Yes. Okay. Okay. Both in agreement. Paige still the GOAT. Uh, I definitely agree with the acc accolades argument. I think it's almost like, in my opinion, like if let's say Kristen, let's say Kristen had one more dominant year and then for whatever reason retired, I do think 20 years from now, people would look back and be like, well, Paige has all, it would almost be like Kristen would get lost in translation. It almost would feel like we'd have to be arguing for her. Like if you could have seen her playing, she didn't have enough time to get the accolades yeah. in the States. But if you would have seen her play, you would have known how good she was. Could be an interesting one. Anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, there's still plenty of time for her to just rack up the accolades anyway. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, so we're heading into Maple Hill for the MVP Open this upcoming weekend. Uh, Maple Hill, very beloved course. It's been around for a long time. It's widely known. I think it's still the number one course in the country. Am I wrong on that? Um, I, th I think UDIS gives it the number one still. Uh, so my question is simply, it's number one course in the country according to UDISC. Is it the best course on tour? And if not, what is? Hunter. Ah, uh, look, I want to say yes. I want to roll with it and be like, yeah, it's the best number one course. I buy into the hype. I haven't played it. It is the number one course on my mm -hmm. wish list to play. But no, it's not the best course on tour. Here's my reasoning. I think it's too short for the tour. Um, and I think if you moved it out of its location, the scenery around it, out of its environment, out of the history, and you just put it onto a random piece of property, it wouldn't be nearly as beloved by the modern tour. Um, and I don't really think it has much room to grow. So there could be a day in our near future where the tour outgrows Maple Hill. Um, and the next one that I'm going to say is the best course on tour is going to be very controversial. I'm not going to side. The commons aren't going to side with me here, but hear my point. I think we have to do the same thing. You have to take the course out of the context, put it on a different piece of property and think through it. Think through what it does to players. Think through how it makes players their score breaks men makes men cry out there winthrop gold usdgc i think is the best course on tour every year it challenges pros it pushes their limits it adapts year after year to where we are what 25 years into this thing and it is still pushing the top level of the game to where it is still the hardest major to win it'll probably always be the hardest major to win and the course design as gimmicky and fluky as you <clears> might want to call it it shines and does exactly what it's designed to do and i think that makes it the best course on tour Okay. Okay. Tyler, how do you respond? Yeah. So, uh, good points. I like that response for sure. Um, I think when we're looking at Maple Hill being the best course, I think, you know, I hate that word best. Like if we're, if there was a different word to use, maybe we could have more arguments for Maple Hill. Honestly, I don't think Maple Hill is the best course on tour. I think when you're looking at the best course on tour, you want to see, okay, what is a fair assessment of someone's skill? And I feel like at Maple Hill, when you're looking at it, the line sometimes can, can be a little tight where you can get some finicky kicks. You almost have to get lucky sometimes on some of those holes. It's a very well-constructed course, very beautifully uh, well done and manicured. But the unlucky kicks, I don't believe that is a true test of someone's disc golf skill. When you're looking at that, I think it's idle wild. And the reason why is that you look down the list of people who've won it, they're great players and also there hasn't been a repeat champion in a very long time. So this is going back from 23 to 17. Gannon Burr, Isaac Robinson, Kyle Klein, Eagle McMahon, Kevin Jones, Paul McBeth, and James Conrad. All very well players, but a bunch of world titles on that list. It's a true test when you go to Idlewild. We're in the woods. You're also coming out of the woods. And it's a phenomenal tournament every year. I look forward to watching it every year. MVP, it's like, okay, you know, Simon said last year when he won, I got a couple lucky kicks down the road, and that's how I got into a position to win the tournament. So I think it has to go to Idlewild right now on tour. Okay. I like that pick. I like that pick. I think that one resonates a lot for me as well, Tyler. And I think those are good points. Um, Maple Hill stands are crumbling in the comments right now. I'm sure there's a lot of typing going on. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. We're all tied up here. So the way we'll do this is my last question is who is your favorite to win the M MVP open in the MPO division? Don't think we have to pick favorites in FPO. Um, 
I'm assuming Kristen is there, right? She's not back in Estonia. So uh, the way I'll do this is I won't give out any points initially. Whoever convinces me the most of their favorite, I will make them the winner today. So Tyler, lead off for us here. Okay. So I tried to really look at a list of players and people who I think you can give some some way to Isaac, but I'm not going to choose Isaac. You could give some way to like a Dickerson or, or someone that's a pure woods player. But I'm going to be choosing someone who is a phenomenal circle two putter this season. They've been great all, all year in that area. They, their putter has been hot all season. Um, and that's going to be Kelvin Heimberg. And I know he's been a great player this year, um, but I think he's going to get it done. I think his circle two putting has been great this year, better than the last couple of seasons. Um, and Calvin knows that course very well. He can craft his shots there. He keeps it low to the ground. I've seen Calvin play at um, Iron Hill at, at the Delaware Disc Golf Challenge, and he tears that course up uh, because he keeps it low to the ground in tight wooded areas, and Iron Hill is a very tight wooded area, very similar to uh, uh, MVP Maple Hill. So I think Calvin's got to be your guy. He needs this win, dude. He needs to start racking up some points, and he's going to get the putter going. I, I would say his circle two is what gets it done for him this tournament. Okay, okay. Certainly um, certainly a guy who, you, like, the desperation factor has to be kicking at this point. He's desperate to get a win at the second half of this season, have something to roll him into next year. Um, Hunter, who do you have? Any counters? What do you got? <clears throat> Yeah, I think he left it all for the taking here for me because I think it's a pretty obvious answer. We got to take Isaac Robinson. I mean, the guy just won Worlds. He goes straight to Canada, plays a silver event for who knows why, takes Eagle McMahon to a six-hole playoff, fresh off of Worlds. Typically, the post-Worlds curse, it's very hard to win or do anything good post-Worlds. He proved that. He hasn't got rust on his game post-Worlds. And we're coming into a course that is all about angle control when your disc is landing. And this season... Really, for the past few seasons, I think Isaac Robinson is the best in the world at that shot. And like I just said, Maple Hill is a short course, so we're not losing distance to a lot of people. There's short par fours, short par threes. It's a lot of putter and mid, touchy, land it soft type shots. And if we're worried about putting, Isaac Robinson's one of the greatest putters of all time. So we're not worried about him on the green either. And to counter the Calvin point slightly... Look, I understand I've come after Calvin a lot of different ways, a lot of different angles. I love Calvin. I think he's one of the greatest players of all time. The problem is we have watched him crumble in clutch time. I think there's too much pressure on him right now to win. There's too much of a narrative that he feels like he has to win, and I don't think he can really do that. I don't think he's that clutch of a player anymore. I don't know what happened, but we've seen him miss like 10 or 15-foot putts when the clutch time comes, and we're talking we have to, he has to hit circle two putts all tournament for a clutch time. I don't think it's going to happen. I think this is Isaac Robinson's tournament. Um, it just makes too much sense. I just want to say also there's fatigue involved. And also Isaac did not putt well from circle two at all. He was 141st at Worlds in putting from circle two. So his putter has not been hot lately. Mm. Takes one weekend. It's an interesting counter. My, this is a tough one for me because I don't really, I, I wouldn't expect Isaac to win again. That, that's maybe just odd bias there. Superstition, if you will. Calvin, you know, last year he finished outside the top 25 at Maple Hill, but I know that that was kind of an outlier. He's had some good finishes at that course in the past. Um, I think I'm going to have to phone a friend here, Brody. What do, oh, who, do you, who, can, who convinced you the most? I've been on your side for a long time, Brody. Remember that. Well, I'll say this. One, one thing that people get wrong about Isaac and this is, again, by no, no means saying that he's a bad putter, but one people that people think that he's a phenomenal putter because he has tournaments. My camera is going nuts. <laughs> he has tournaments that we've watched where he just seems to not miss any pet putt. Uh, but that's not, that's not the norm. So I, I, I feel like I have to give it to Tyler because the reason Shocker. why Isaac is wow. the reason why Brody. Isaac he didn't give it to me. What? The, Who saw that the one? The reason coming? why Isaac is as dominant as he has been in these tournaments isn't necessarily the putting it's the uh, throwing off the tee. He is by far one of the, has one of the best back ends. Hey man, Brody doesn't don't need a back end. Brody okay. doesn't speak for me, man. Don't you worry, Hunter. No, I'm still going to, I'm, I'm going to pick Tyler as well. I think yeah. uh, I, I do. I don't like, I don't really love Isaac. Can we tournament. retrospect it when Isaac wins this weekend? Can yes. I get this win? Yes. If Isaac wins this weekend, it, it, if anybody else wins, it stays Tyler's wins in the records. Yeah. We'll record that in the but book. When but if Isaac, Isaac wins this weekend, if Calvin yeah. wins, you're done being on the show for the rest of the year. How's that? 
Deal. I'll shake okay. on it. <laughs> I'm done being on the show. Calvin wins. Win. Isaac wins. I get this uh, one. Yeah, uh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm a sign man of my word. Night, please email me. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, that's going to do it. Tyler, you are our champion today. Um, I say nice something pro- real quick? Of course. Hey, I just want to appreciate everyone who's been posting, or not posting, but signing the petition for Save Stafford Woods. It seems like that course is going to be saved because Uh-oh. of some relational things going on between different things. We're just waiting to hear back uh, from the government. So keep going. Save Stafford Woods, please. It's a phenomenal course in the area. I only live an hour away. We want to save that course. Thank you so much uh, for all the people who have been doing that. Very yeah, nice. Uh, do they still hate me? Uh, I would tread mm. lightly, Brody. People were mad that you dismissed or said something right after I said something two weeks ago. They weren't too happy about that, saying you were trying to, to dismiss what I said. But very dismissive, what? Brody Smith. You, you, uh, you Brody just said something Smith. right after me. Uh, Hunter, go ahead. Oh, you're not. I, just, to say, I just wanted. I to, just did that again. I said, yeah, stop oh, dismissing people, Brody. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just wanted to point sorry, out. I'm that, sorry for continuing to try to have the conversation. Apologies. I, I just wanted to point out <laughs> that Isaac Robinson has a better circle two putting percentage than Calvin Heimberg this season so far. I do know that. Tyler didn't make that as one of his points, points though. Right now, right just now, wanted though. to point that out. I understand. He, he didn't use that as, a, as the brunt of his argument, though. No. Look up, look up well, circle one, Well, Brody was one, using though. it as a brunt look, of the no, argument. because look up circle one. Look up circle one, though. They're within Don't one percent of each other. Two. They're within yeah. one look percent of each other. One. They're putting the same. It, it's, damn. Damn. Hey, it's neither come, here. Come, come better prepared next time. That's all It's neither say. here nor there. Shout out that old bay pillow that Tyler has. That's very cool. Um, go Maryland. Go Orioles. I need to figure we'll, out how long I need to football. wait. That's what Maryland does. <laughs> we will. Uh, we will see you next week for another episode of Debate Night. We'll be back. Thoughts and prayers to Aaron Rodgers and all of Jets Nation.